Welcome to the Inflection Podcast, where we explore the pivotal moments that have shaped us into who we are today. I am your host, Anabi, and I can't wait to dive into these moments with you. Let's get it. Welcome to another episode of the Inflection Podcast. It's a pleasure to have with me here today, Jared Credit, President and CEO of K2 Electric. Thank you for hopping on board with us. Thanks for having me on. Yes, sir. So you're pretty plugged in to the ecosystem, right? Out here in the Phoenix area with the Arizona Builders Alliance. You've led that leadership for that. Same with being a member of the Young Professionals Committee for Associated Builders and Contractors association for you giving to the community is a big deal what has that looked like for you just plugging in and and serving in the community yeah i think it probably started by something that was modeled so my father has been in this industry for a long time and different association but really got engaged and so i saw the importance of, of giving back but to be frank i saw also the value strategically in the organization when when you're connected with folks, it, it just creates opportunity. And it, I think it's specifically in the, in the industry, it's twofold, right? There's building the network, but then a lot of these trade associations have impact on training and development. Yeah. And so that it's in some ways self-serving for, the, for our organization that we wanna train and develop our folks and make sure there's good resources, we wanna be networked. Uh, but then it goes beyond that. And uh, I think there came a point where it switched of this just feels good and I have acquired some talents and I have some abilities, so I should be using them, not just within my company in, in, in a for-profit way, but in a way to give back. That's awesome, I, I love it. You officially joined K2, the family biz, 2008. You, you held a variety of roles, yep. starting from you know estimator, uh, all the way to accounting operations. What did that journey look like? And that's a very interesting model, by the way. I, I love business, building them, growing them, investing in them. And I, I would hope for my kids that they can really get into it and learn versus just, here you go, you're the CEO now, but it would be nice for them to w- walk through. Was that something your dad also put in place or how did that look like for you? Like just doing a bunch of roles, at the company before growing to the president and CEO. Yeah, it would, it would be cool if it was like we had this master plan. <laughs> uh, Here is the blueprint. Certainly there was some intentionality along the way, but there was a lot that wasn't. So growing up, he always, he didn't go to college. He was a tradesman. And so in his mind, it was like, go to college and get a real job. Construction's really volatile, cyclical, and stay away from it. I accepted that for a while. I went to college. I started studying uh, pre-med, getting a science-based degree. No way. Yeah. I thought I was going to be a doctor. And I got through one semester and realized uh, a couple things. One, I, I, moving from a small high school to a large university, I realized there's a lot of people a lot smarter than me. And then the second thing I realized is that I wanted college to be uh, a little bit more of a fun fun experience as opposed to just being in the library all the time and so I still didn't know what I want to do but I flipped to business because I was like this will open up plenty of doors give me a lot of options and so I flipped to business and then Wait, pause, pause a little bit you when you say you flip to business you make it sound so easy flip was there any angst there with the expectations from your folks with that flip what not, was that? Not like? really. No, the the route that I was originally on was very much my own. Okay. Enjoyed science classes and had done enough in school, but that wasn't like it was impressed upon me. Like, okay. Oh, you need to be a doctor. Like, okay. The, cool. In our family, that's what we need. It wasn't like that. So no, my parents were super supportive, and yeah, the business degree not like it was easy, but relative to the track I was on of physics and organic chemistry <laughs> and all this, it, yeah. it was significantly a simpler path. And, yeah and less narrow right and the the pre-med path had one place it was going to go and uh, where with business i knew that i could take that wherever so then about halfway through school as my dad was getting k2 really ramping it up because he had a business sold it and this was the second go around that was when in some conversations and i would go and i'd work in the field in the summer so i was very familiar with the business where this switch flipped i'm like 
I, I really think what I'm learning in, in school, and some of this was naive at the time, thought I was getting a lot more tool, tools than, <laughs> than I was. My business background, his trade background, because that's really what he always loved was the trade side of it. What are we actually doing in, in the field to solve problems for people? So I was like, this could be a great relationship. And so I made the decision to switch. Started as an estimator because we were still doing some growth, 2008. So the um, which the the economy was starting to crumble. Yeah, I was like 2008. But there's a lag generally in construction because we get into longer term contracts, and so we usually get caught on the back end of a, of a down cycle. And so it was October. I started in June, October. We get the first phone call like, hey, this project is shutting down. Cancel all the orders because the bank that was funding it, they, they're not in existence anymore. Whoa. So there may be some money later, but right now there is no cash for this project. And so that was really the start. Um, And then rolled into 2009 and we we had to downsize. And so the diversity of roles that I took on was actually more caused by that than it was like this plan of, hey, we're gonna put you in different areas of the business. It was out of necessity. So we, we started cutting staff and we got to a point in 2010 where I was the only, with my dad, I was the only person that was gonna still be working in the office. We had another estimator and my brother, and they were about to go out onto a project and work the tools on. So in that time, I took on accounting, I took on HR, I was doing some operations stuff. Man, so it was, it was that really was out crazy. of necessity. And it was a difficult time, but reflecting now, I'm really appreciative, because had I just stayed in one lane, uh, I, I wouldn't understand what we do to, to the extent that I do. Yeah. So now it's, it's made you a lot more intimately familiar with different areas of the business. Uh, it's, For sure. I'm sure it's very helpful as the, the head honcho right now. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. We, with you being an active member of the AZ Builders Alliance, and you serve there in also various capacities, yeah. it seems that's a theme with you. Like you, you plug in where it's needed, you, you take on a bunch of stuff. That, that's really cool. How would you say these, have, these different roles have influenced your perspective on the construction industry in general, but maybe even how you lead at K2 Electric right now? One thing, I say this a lot, but I've heard a lot of people say it in our space specifically, is for how big of a town this is, the construction industry is incredibly small. And so the way that plays out for me is, and and I think some of this is just how I'm wired, but build relationships, be good to people, be kind, you know, some of the basics, right, that we learn as a kid, but just how applicable it is because someone I met 10 years ago at an event, now today could, they may have changed roles, changed companies, and then it could be really important for our organization that relationship when it when it first happened was a good experience and can be built upon yeah so i think that that's really the the big perspective i've gotten out of being engaged in this and just seeing this is the only industry i've really been in i'm sure there's plenty of other good industries but yeah construction is just full of just genuine good people a lot of folks come up through the craft side that's how they get, even if they get into executive roles or whatever it may be and concepts around hard work and, and some of that they're just ingrained in them and so it just it's a fun industry full of really good people yeah absolutely you, you've emphasized before like the diversity of the k2 team right as a strength mm-hmm. that you see like how do you build that in diversity in, into your company culture and also along that end like how do you foster like a collaborative environment at, at the company yeah it's challenging uh, yeah <laughs> it's challenging so i think first is recognizing the importance of it if you don't value it then you're not going to do things to to foster it so recognizing it talking about it and then a lot of to me a lot of how you work through productively in diverse and inclusive environments is being really big on communication because the, the more similar you are to someone, the more there's just some understandings that don't even have to be spoken, right? But yeah. the more diverse you are, the more you have to clearly communicate, what are you thinking or why are we doing this? And it's still a big work in progress, but being overly communicative is, is always a goal of mine. And then setting some ground rules for what does communication look like and what are we expected to communicate to one another? And, and some of that's an attitude, but then some of it's more tactical and, and process driven at the project level it's okay what are the meeting sequences we're going to have to kick off a project correctly to make sure that this diverse group of people all has the same understanding of what what we're about to endeavor on yeah 
Absolutely, absolutely. What is something you know now that you wish you knew when you you started this journey, growing to starting off at K two as an estimator, all the way to being the the president and CEO, or a few things. Maybe you have a few things that、mm. come to mind now. You're like, crap! I wish I knew this sooner. <laughs> Man, there, yeah, there's a lot. I don't know as much as I think I know. Surprise! <laughs> yeah, I had I had a few stretches in my career where I thought I knew best and thought I had it all figured out, and then was swiftly humbled. The challenge with that, though, is that I don't know that, like, I wouldn't want it to play out differently, because that really impacts how I operate today. And if I if I didn't make mistakes and get, then I I wouldn't have those learning lessons. I I think that. Oh,、uh, okay. It probably sucked at the time、yeah. when it happened, but in retrospect, you're like, yeah, this the, was good. <laughs> yeah, the missteps feel terrible in the moment,、yeah. but I feel like the the learning from that, which I guess. You have to do. You do have to make a choice to learn, but in some of these scenarios, there <laughs> there was no other way than to learn. Oh, that that didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> and I I think the other big mistake or, or the thing I didn't really understand is it's far more important to look for people that are a culture fit than it is for like their individual contributor talents. People that can go. Execute well in a role, especially thinking of like our craft side out in the field. That can be really easy. Be like, oh, this person just gets things done. But if they don't fit in culturally, you can lose so many people or, or lose a lot of momentum. And so it's understanding that cultural fit is more important than just assessing the those tangible talents of、yeah. how can someone go, just go tactically operate. But do they fit? And do they want to live out our values as best they can? Yeah, I, I've heard one one of the、uh, bosses I had in the past. He he talked about from this perspective. He said that the different kinds of people. There are those that they execute really well. They get stuff done, but they leave a trail of bodies,、mm. right?、Yep. That's a crazy image. Or there are those who also get stuff done,、um, but they do it collaboratively with others. And obviously, if you ask any sane person, they say, "Oh, I, I go with the second person if、yeah. given the choice." Many times, companies will sacrifice that. And, yeah, he, she, whatever, they, they get stuff done. Yeah, they're caustic. Yeah, they don't get along with people, but they bring results. And many times, that's a, for lack of a better term, like a cancer for the organization because now you have someone who gets the job done. Hopefully, but no one gets along with them. They don't fit the culture, and you're going to have other people leaving because, hey, I'm going to go elsewhere.、Yep. <laughs> I don't want to do this. So long, long run. In the long run, it actually ends up hurting the culture and hurting the company and the company bottom line, eventually. For sure. Congratulations, y'all! You you got the Tucson Premium Outlets. That was a big contract for you guys, and I would say it was a major inflection point. Helped you. Help propel you into the Tucson market. You're、yep. expanding there right now. Any any behind the scenes look at that? What did that look like? Was it a long time coming? Maybe you'd been working towards that for a while, or just one of those things that just one of those things.、Uh, it's funny because now it's like the second thing you asked me about my career path, and which brings up an important thing. I think that、uh, certainly having plans and intention that's all important, but also knowing how to strike where opportunity is and. Capitalizing on it, even if it wasn't necessarily a part of the plan, that's、yeah. also important. True. Having, in this case, with that Tucson Premium Outlets, a little bit of a, a risk tolerance that maybe at times can be a little dangerous. You got to balance it <laughs> because we definitely were over our skis for a moment on that project. We had done a few projects in the Tucson area, but hadn't had a real specific intention of hey, we're going to open an office. We were open to it, but it wasn't like a pursuit. But at the time, we had been doing a bunch of solar here in the Phoenix market, and some regulation change changes that happened. It really slowed the market down, and so we were adjusting. And workload in the Phoenix area was a little light, and we had a client reach out and they said, "Hey, we've got this project down in Tucson. You're a trusted partner, and and they didn't operate in Tucson either. So they're like, we want to get you on this." I said no two or three times. I was like, "This thing is massive for us in general." And then to be in a different geographic market, I'm like this, in construction. That's several strikes against this being a good idea. Yeah. But they were persistent. They're like, no, we've got a great partnership. We're all going to make this work. Let's go learn together. <clears throat> so we said yes. We we proposed on it, 
And that was a cool journey too, just because of a much larger project, a lot more nuance when you're actually sitting down with the client and saying, okay, do you have everything and what's the approach on this going to be? And then we got into it and we realized that we had some mistakes like in our estimate and even like mobilizing a team down there was pretty challenging. But the way we got into it, the client who was a partner, not just a client, but truly a partner, that was critical to the success of it because we were able to have that open dialogue of like, hey, here's where we've got some shortcomings in our proposal and if there's some opportunity, we need to rebuild our budget. And and a lot of that happened and turned out to be just incredibly successful. And then at, by the end, we had 40 or 50 folks on the craft side that we had, we had built up in that market. Wow. That, that client said the same thing at the same time, hey, we're going to open an office. We're like, great, let's do it. And so we rolled into, it was a smaller project than that one, but rolled into another project, and that was what got us <laughs> started in Tucson. That is awesome. It's Isn't it cool to look back at those pivots, those pivotal moments where this had to happen, for this to happen, for this to happen. And oh, yeah. it, it's always amazing for yeah. me uh, to look back at all those times in hindsight. <laughs> oh, yeah, it, it blows my mind. Because today, still, Phoenix is uh, our biggest market by a long shot, but our largest project, yet again, is back in Tucson. That's so. cool. Oh, my gosh. Along those lines, you, you have a Joko Willink quote yeah. haha, <laughs> um, that speaks about not settling for the status quo, not, not getting comfortable and settling for that. I'm going to ask other times where not settling for the status quo led to breakthrough or significant forward motion. I don't know if the Tucson thing falls under that, but I will read the Joko Willink uh, quote for those watching and listening. If you allow the status quo to pers- persist, you expect to improve performance and you can't expect to win. Right, so what, along those lines, like are there times where you've challenged the status quo or not gotten comfortable with it and you saw significant yeah. growth from that? Yeah, for sure. It's probably a lot of small examples, but a couple of big ones that come to mind. Four or five years ago, it was around 2018, 2019, a friend, mentor who's in the industry was talking to me about this concept that they had adopted and it had to do with how you price work in construction when you have specifically when you have craft labor a lot of people take the uh, approach of we just need to get a certain percentage over our cost and that that's how we're going to build out our budget for what we need to price work at for example like maybe we need to put 20 percent over cost on a proposal across the board and then that'll hit get us to our net profit target that that we want but what The problem that has is that every project we do has a different mix of labor, material, equipment. And so when you have a project that's heavier on the labor, when you have a set, or maybe it's a small range, but you have the set markup percentage, you're in a a labor heavy job. If you actually break it down to what did we earn per hour on a dollar basis, you make a lot less. And the pandemic situation aside and all the procurement issues, in general, material is just material. You just go acquire it. Labor, the craft labor, the, the skilled workforce is our most finite resource. And it's a totally different way of thinking about rather than what's this flat percentage we need to put out everything, it's what do we need to make per man hour, per labor hour in the field to best utilize that. It's, is this project over here going to yield the most or this one is okay let's go with that and if I showed you the math it's very simple it's not a complex thing but it's a completely different way to think about it and so pushing that forward because there was some resistance of because one of the things that yields out of it is there's whole sectors of work that you just stop doing because you're like oh we can't actually the market won't bear the right amount of margin per craft hour on this type of work so we just got to stop doing it yeah but that could be with like our favorite client or favorite contact or whatever. And so it was pretty difficult in the beginning, but as soon as like it clicked for a number of the team, and now it's, we almost can't think in terms of the old way. Wow, I don't, that was good. It doesn't matter what you marked it up, but what's the, what's we call return per man hours. I need to know what the return per man hour is. And, and that's our folks in the field care a lot about too. But then the biggest one is right now we're in the middle of it and it's, we're working to be more of a manufacturer not just on the job site constructing, but pre-manufacture, prefabrication is another term in our industry. And it's how much can we design and plan and execute before we ever step on site? 
and there are a multitude of reasons for it. One is controlled environment, like a manufactured manufacturing setting allows for a little bit better flow. But then it's also how do we deliver to the installer? Because like internally, that's our client. The installer yeah. is our client internally, like our team members that actually put product in a building. How do we make it simpler for them to install was give them all of the materials, all of the tools and all of the information they need in the place that they actually need to install. So that's a big part of this initiative is you know, building out what we call kits to land, not in a connex that's a thousand feet away from where they're, but they're gonna install, but put it right where they're gonna install it and give them all the information they need. And so we could continue to operate to the quote, we could continue to operate like we have and just drop the material, figure it out on site. But eventually I think the market really is gonna shift in this direction rather than be behind and catch up. And, and there's plenty of people that are doing this now, but it's not like universal in the market. So it's no, we need, we need to make a change now. We need, yeah. we need to get better now. And it's not simple. It's been a challenging, painful process when you make big changes like that and a lot yeah. of big investment. And, but yeah, I would say that we're living it right now. That's awesome. And that leads me to the next question along those lines. So you, you've been able to take on challenging projects, challenge the, the status quo, uh, take the not easy path to, to make things happen. What advice would you give to uh, professionals, specifically in the construction industry? But I think this applies to a lot of industries that may, at large uh, to navigate complexity uh, complex projects successfully? Yeah, great question. Yeah, and I, I think a construction project is not exclusive to anything you endeavor on. I believe the first thing is you've got to know, you need to understand yourself. And certainly who am I at my core and identity and some of that, I'm talking about that, but also like just how do I tactically operate? Example for myself, we use a tool called Predictive Index. At, at K2, K2 Electric, behavioral assessment tool, like a Myers-Briggs, strengths finders type thing, but a little bit simpler, and that's why we use it, because it just makes it better to execute with. But through using that tool, for myself, what I know is that <clears throat> one of the markers is like, what's where do you fit in formality versus informal? Kind of, are you black and white and rules, or are you more, everything's gray and informal? Are you into detail, not into detail? I'm on the not a lot of detail, everything's gray. And so I know that in certain areas of the business, I have to have people that are on the other end of the spectrum. Because I, it's hard for me, it's almost painful for me to really swing over there. And the tool gives you an understanding of like how far, how extreme are you? And I'm pretty extreme. So I'm like, okay, I gotta... <laughs> I resonate with that. Yeah, and, it, and it's, I could go back to when I was seven and I'm like, yeah, that, that's been in me <laughs> since I was born. So I think that's the key when you're endeavoring on a complex project or you know, you're building a business is first, who am I and what do I bring to the table? Because the opposite of that is like through behavioral assessments or whatever it may be, you're going to have strengths. You're going to have things that you do really well. And so it's okay, I got, uh, here's the 10 things I need. I can check four of those boxes. Now, how do I go take care of the other six? And in an organization like ours, it's generally bringing team members onto the team. But even if it's if you're in a startup or smaller, maybe it's you're bringing in outside partners, vendor type scenarios where yeah. you're bringing people to shore up, what do I not have? And so then that's really the second thing is building a team because it's like anything that's process or none of that happens until you get the humans together. Yeah, absolutely. So it's know yourself, build the team. And then, and this is something that I actually struggle with and why I have to have these people on the team, but then it's, okay, how do we build out a plan and how do we break this complex situation into simpler steps? And then it's just one step at a time. And, and I think like an important mantra for people is, what's the best next thing I can do with the information that's available to me? As opposed to, what's the best thing I can do? It's no, it's what information do I have and what is the, the best next thing I can do? Because if, if we blow it up into too much, then we can get stuck into paralysis and yeah. I just don't know where to go. Okay, what do I know and what can I do next? And then just keep repeating that and before you know it, you're well underway. Yeah, I, I really like that. On the podcast recently, I talked with one of the guests about like breaking things down into chunks similar to this. And it's so easy to 
overcomplicate things, look at the big picture and go, whoa, that is ginormous. It, it's a lot more daunting when you look at it that way. But when you break it down into smaller, achievable chunks, I feel like that even builds momentum. Instead of looking at 10,000 foot view, whoa, that's huge. If you break it down to achievable steps that all link together and cascade into each other, that also builds momentum because, oh, I got one done, two, three, four. Yep. And then you get into the rhythm of getting it done versus this is an elephant. Like, right. wh where do I even start, <laughs> start this? For myself, personally, I have a framework. It doesn't work for everything. I, I like building frameworks. Uh, it's, I use it for projects at my web design firm and even for some personal projects. And it's MSD3 and it's map. The, when there's something, especially something more challenging, I have to map it out first. And then I sketch. So loose sketches for how I feel like I might accomplish that. Mm -hmm. Maybe even steps there. Yeah. And then there's design, which adds some more clarity to it, like more achievable steps and chunks. And then there's develop, which is doing the work. Okay, now let's start with one. One is done, two, two is done, I move. And then there's deliver, like it's done. Now yeah. connect it all, here's the finished product. Now, that's an oversimplification for a lot of things, but it helps me think through things and even complex topics. I'm like, okay, I now have to map it out first, lose connections all the way to this is what it looks like for it to be done. So I visualize that real quick yeah. now for projects or things I'm trying to approach. And it's very helpful to think that way for that's me. Great. So you have a very busy schedule, leading a company, partnerships, CrossFit, <laughs> cooking, coaching kids, soccer. How do you balance it all? Family, business, leisure, like how do you balance all of this? And to that too, I will say, one of my uh, conversations, uh, someone challenged me about the whole notion of balance. He was like, there's no such thing as balance. There is work-life integration. But, so shout out to you, Kalim. That was what he said, and I was like, that's thought provoking, that's interesting. But still, I will use the term balance for this conversation. How do you, you know, do all of these things and, and still win? Uh, yeah, with I'm glad you mentioned that, what, what uh, your buddy said, because that, that resonates with me. And I think there's some different buzzwords and you know all that, but I, I would lend more or lean more towards, I don't think balance is quite the right way to, to frame it. and. I, I read something recently and someone was there they broke down life in the seven areas right and they said to execute really well mathematically it's not there's not enough hours in the week and I won't go into all the detail and I don't even remember it but I just remember thinking like oh that, that's right like family work faith spiritual and, and you, you go into these different quadrants and it was if you said okay this is probably the right amount of time per week to spend on each of these it's more than our bodies can actually be awake. <laughs> so it's like, good luck. It's like, all right, that's a good starting place to say, I can't do all of these things all at once. And so if some of it is like a seasonality approach and the, on the work side, it's really important. Something that I have to remind myself of is I can't run hard for forever. Cause if I do, that means I'm ignoring some of these other areas yeah. for forever. And so the seasonal approach, one of the things now having little kids, is when they're off, it's not like I completely stop working, but that's where Natalie, my wife, and I, we really look to do experiences with them. So in the summers especially, over the last few summers, we, we really worked to get out of town and go on nice. trips. And so I think that's part of it is that seasonal approach of knowing like when do I need to be heavier in one area and, and lighter in others, but making sure I don't run for forever in one track. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is just constantly my wife really helps me with this is like asking does this really matter if i'm contemplating going to an event or getting on a committee or a board it's does this really matter can i bring value and does it bring value to me uh, which is super hard like I've, I've failed on that plenty of times and then i have to move out of things and it's <laughs> uncomfortable but, and then i think the, the last piece for me is like knowing what are the non-negotiables like fitness has become one of those things that I can skip a day, but I can't go for three months and not work out. Like, it's just not good for my mental health. It's, yeah. it's not about, cause I, I need to look a, a certain way or I need to be able to squat a certain amount. It's uh, my mentally, I got to keep those guns. Yeah, I, I need, I know that I need that for myself. And so it's yeah. okay. That 
that has to stay in the rhythm. And we like with my kids, it's okay, I was gone three nights in a row or I was out of town. It's okay, the next few days I need to make sure that I'm really intentionally connecting with them and around in the evening and, and spending time with them. So yeah. I guess just paying attention to what, where have I been ignoring and where do I need to, to put some more energy in. I like that. So it's, I guess I could say, a constant dance, yeah. right? It's it's not a problem that you have a silver bullet for. It's solved forever. It's, it's You talk with your wife, you assess. So there's this idea of it's something you're going to have to keep calibrating and, and adjusting, right, yeah. as you go along. And I have found that to be true myself. My wife also really challenges me with, because I love doing a lot of things. Like, it's fun being in comedies and, and all of that stuff, yeah. but... She similar. Is this something you should be doing right now? Right, you know. And it's, what do you mean? <laughs> well, I guess that's true. That the think just thinking. I think now I apply more rigor and then thought to events. What, what I get to do. I think having kids too, like, puts things in perspective a little bit Game more. Yeah. yeah, where I would have gone to a lot more things in the past, but yeah. now it's like the opportunity cost yeah. is time with family, time with the kid. We have you know a daughter. She is 15 months old. And now I just something I'll skip on that yeah. just because of that. I feel like I'm a lot more acutely aware. <laughs> Time is finite. I think that's uh, the perfect way to say it. You, you got to assess the opportunity cost. Well said. Yeah. And lastly, we can't skip talking about food. You you love to cook. <laughs> what's your favorite dish or dishes uh, to cook? And what's a your new a, a good restaurant? Maybe a, a staple or one you found recently and you're like, this oh, is legit. Man. Yeah. <laughs> That, so this is another reason I work out, <laughs> is very passionate about food. Yeah. I would say I always have been, but then my wife and I, that's been like a cornerstone of our relationship. Yeah. A good meal out, either by ourselves or with friends. So I don't cook as much as I used to, but my two favorite things still right now, my Traeger smoker, which is, a little, I feel like I'm cheating a little bit, but I don't care. <laughs> it works. There, there's still some art and science in getting it right and having the patience because it's a long process. So anything on the smoker. And then I've always loved breakfast because I think breakfast can be like this really rushed thing, especially with kids. So like on a weekend, I love to slow it down and actually take some time. Not like I'm making anything that intricate, but just a little extra love when you're nice. cooking those eggs to make sure they're nice <laughs> and fluffy or whatever. Restaurants, I think we have a really, here in Phoenix, we're, we're, there's plenty of cities that have great dining scenes, but I, I think we have some unique stuff here Yeah. and, and growing. Uh, the A couple of favorites recently, actually this past weekend, Natalie and I went to a restaurant called Chorus. It's Scottsdale Road, Shea Boulevard. And it's one of these places where it's a set menu. You just you're, you're paying a set price, and and then they're going to deliver what what they've decided the menu is. And it's ten. I, th- I think they say ten courses. I feel like we ended up with fourteen. <laughs> and they're, they're smaller plates. Yeah, some awesome. are one or two bites. Some are you know, like five or six. Which I love those experiences. But this place, like every single dish, was just on point. Wow! Like the flavor, That's the cool. temperature, like everything was just. We'll have to put a excellent. link to this place yeah, in the yeah. show notes. Yeah, it, it costs a few dollars, but you know that if you go on their website, they bill it. It's it, it's an experience, not a, a dinner, right? You're not going to McDonald's. This is we were there for three and a half hours. You, you got to dress formal. I'd say it's, you can get away with like snappy casual. Okay. It was it wasn't like a stuffy fine dining type experience, and then. A regular spot, there's a spot over in Awatuki that my wife and I have been going to for forever called Hillside Spot. They just, they do well. It's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Kids eat free a couple nights a week. So we've been going there for probably 10 years. <laughs> You're regular. I'm probably there at least once a week because I'll, I'll do breakfast things for work and or lunch. And then with the family, we go for dinner. That's a staple for us. That's awesome. I love it. Thank you so much, Jared, for hopping on with us today. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. For sure. Appreciate it. Let's do it again. Yeah. Sweet. Dude, you're El Natural. That was good, bro. Thanks, man.